Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the pretty big 13-game main slate we have here on uh, Tuesday, August 15. Um, disappointing night last night from Arizona, of course, but it uh, looks like, I mean, it was Texas, a couple Cardinals pieces that got you there. Um, you know, it was kind of a, a fishy evening when Chris Plexen tears you apart, right? So, that said, we still have... Arizona in Colorado once again, um, leading the way in ownership naturally. Obviously much easier to fade them tonight on a full 13-game slate. Plenty of interesting tournament spots here. Um, one, obviously, giant red box here for Oakland. They don't have an official announced starter just yet. Uh, I have Spencer Watkins going. Um, but he's not in the player pool, so you're not going to play him against Cardinals anyway. But um, that's that's who I've got. We'll go over that when we get to the game. Uh, really fishy pricing. Excuse me. Uh, fishy pricing on um, yeah, the, on the mound here today. Like I don't know what we're doing with eleven thousand Jordan Montgomery and, and things like this. Like Yusei Kikuchi nine thousand. He's overpriced. Michael Walker ninety eight hundred. He's overpriced. Giolito at 10-7 against Texas, uh, you know what I mean? So we got we got some you know, real shenanigans going on here, and you can see it kind of materialize just in sort of the uh, the projection in the ownership distribution. We got, you know, this looks like a freaking fireworks went off. You know, we had colors everywhere. So um, not a lot of consistency here. We're going to have to really pick and choose and kind of get into the weeds a little bit and really place some some pricing you know for the most part there are some inefficiencies but um you know really we don't have a choice you got to play some of these guys right so uh let's just get into it we do have projections and ownership loaded to the site already of course so keep an eye out for those let's let's have that at boston and washington uh pavetta on the mound going for boston in all likelihood who knows what they're going to do they've been bringing him out of the bullpen a little bit sometimes as a long reliever um, they have given him some starts. They'll probably just let him start here today because Washington is terrible. Um, and they don't necessarily need to really avoid, uh, you know, some very high upside left-handers, which is where Nick Pavetta really has problems, right? Not so much in the batting average allowed, but a 350 Woba is not small. A 306 ISO is very large, right? 31% K rate's nice, but 40% hard contact is not nice. 070 ground ball to fly ball to the left side. He's exceptionally attackable here with a nearly three homers per nine, two left-handers. Um, so this is why they've been bringing him out of the bullpen. He's been great against right-handers, right? 28% K rate, sub-200 batting average allowed, and it, it, a 270 Woba with a 120 ISO, give or take. That's just fantastic. Um, you know, neutral ground ball to fly ball against the righties with a little bit more hard contact. This is a problem. This has always been Pavetta's problem. It's hard contact and balls in the air. Uh, but Washington isn't all that powerful, right? They don't hit the baseball up and over the wall all that regularly. They don't strike out. They make a lot of contact. Hit for a little bit of batting average, but... For the most part, um, they, you know, they're not going to hit for a lot of power. Just a 134 ISO. Got uh, some, uh, got a goofy number or a goofy display here. Uh, there we go on the sheet. 30% um, hard contact with a lot of ground balls, right? 88 WRC plus. Now they're probably going to have kind of a sneaky number of, of left-handers in the lineup tonight. And with 25% ownership roughly for Nick Pavetta and this slightly elevated price tag for him, I think that we can come off of this a little bit. You don't have to eat this necessarily, even though he does have very impressive strikeout stuff. Um, it's, it's a little bit fishy because he has had some very short outings coming out of the bullpen. 28 appearances this year, and they've only let him you know full start you know, 10 games. Now, that's a, a noisy little um, metric here because sometimes he goes an inning or something. Sometimes he goes four innings. Sometimes he goes seven innings. So a lot of shenanigans that you got to really be careful with with Pavetta here. And with very high ownership and not all that impressive a projection, to be quite honest, for somebody at pushing 8,000, uh, it's... 
I want to probably come off of this a little bit. I think you have to have exposure in in tournaments because he's got enough upside to blast through the Nationals over here, right? But a 12% barrel rate is a major concern. You cannot walk 9 and 10% of people, get on the barrel this often, give up this much hard contact, and really, you know, expect me to be comfortable eating 25% of my teams on you, um, especially at a slightly elevated price tag for him. So I wish he were a little bit cheaper. That would naturally increase his ownership. But, uh, you know, I'm okay playing a little bit of him um, because the upside is there. If he can, you know, even five innings, he could strike out seven or, or eight, no problem here, um, and pick through a pretty low upside lineup. That said, you know, C.J. Abrams, Caber Ruiz doesn't strike out. Dom Smith doesn't really strike out. Ildi Vargas is, well, standing on the left side of the plate. Um, Jake Liu a little bit as well. Rutherford in the outfield. They have some guys here. And, you know, Lane Thomas, Joey Manessis are no slouches either. They have some guys here that can make things a little bit difficult on Pavetta because his numbers against lefties are so bad. And the righties are pretty okay hitters, Lane Thomas and Joey Manessis, even though they don't hit for power. So um, I'm probably going to come in under this figure. I think it's a, a bit too high. I see some uh, some weary metrics here, um, or metrics that make me weary, that is. So I'm going to be careful with this and have a little bit because of the strikeout stuff in tournaments. But I, I don't know. It, it's still pretty hard to go after Washington. JoJo Gray on the mound for them. And I'm probably going to have to leave him on the shelf. If I had to choose between the two, Pavetta and JoJo Gray, uh, price adjusted, I'd play JoJo. But I'm not playing either of them because JoJo doesn't throw it past anybody. And you really need to be able to do that with Boston here. They just got Trevor Story back, um, well, recently, in the last week or so. And you know, this is actually a pretty damn respectable list now for the Red Sox. Uh, Verdugo, Yoshida, Justin Turner... Devers, these guys don't strike out up at the top of the lineup. Trevor Story has dropped the strikeout rate significantly in the last couple of seasons. Tristan Casas, Jaron Duran, still young hitters that are going to swing and miss. But they offer a lot of upside and power from the left side of the plate. Could make it a little bit difficult on JoJo. Now, he's not giving up hard contact anymore. We talked about this ad nauseum this season with JoJo. But he's still walking people, right? 13.5% walk rate to the left side is very concerning. He's still giving up a lot of fly balls there at an 075 ground ball to fly ball. And a lot of the hitters from the left side for Boston have slight ground ball leans, notably Verdugo, Yoshida, and Rafi Devers. They're line drive and ground ball type of hitters. So this is very dangerous. Uh, it's not the best batted ball matchup for a Tristan Casas necessarily or Jaron Duran, but they're very playable in stacks here. So I think JoJo is... Probably going to stay on the shelf for me tonight. It's a difficult spot for him. The strikeout upside is not necessarily there. For Boston, just the 21% in aggregate this year. They do hit for the 262 batting average and sneaky pop at a 175 ISO. These guys can still lift the baseball a little bit, and they can get it on the line. I think it, JoJo could struggle here tonight because he doesn't have a really good changeup. He needs that against a very lefty, heavy lineup over here that doesn't strike out. You need to be able to induce swing and miss against Boston, and JoJo just doesn't have it. So uh, despite a slightly attractive price tag at 77 or 7,600, rather, and a very attractive ownership at 2%, uh, I'm probably going to leave him off. I think the upside is quite questionable in this particular matchup. So offense only for me here. Boston's got to be the favorite, of course, but I think if you want to get some leverage off of this very high Nick Pavetta ownership, play a lefty or, or two uh, from Washington. You can play Jake Alou or an Ildi Vargas, Dom Smith. They're, these guys are cheap. You can make that happen. I don't really want to play 4,700 C.J. Abrams at shortstop, but he's got pretty respectable numbers leading off this year from the left side of the plate. He's expensive, so I'd prefer to just go elsewhere. Um, uh, you could find a, a national stack, I think, mostly just for leverage purposes because I'm not jacked about paying 43 for Caper Ruiz behind the plate when he doesn't have any power either. You know, So it's not excellent getting after some Pavetta here, but a, a leverage stack could be found if you choose to go that way. All right, Philly and Toronto. Um, I don't know, 11-6 for Zach Wheeler against Toronto? What is, what is going on here? DK, I think the pricing admin... You know, fell off the rocking chair. Um, this is a ridiculous. But show me 
anywhere in Zach Wheeler's results this season with consistency um, and and sort of excelling in difficult matchups that would warrant an 11,600 price tag and 25% ownership against Toronto. Like there is just, there's not a single metric uh, from a results perspective that could convince me that that is, should be the case. Now, fundamentally, eh, perhaps, right? The plate discipline stuff is still excellent for Wheeler. Still doesn't walk anybody. Strike one's great. Chase is great. Swing strikes are fine. Call strikes fine. CSW, you know, it's only 28% here, and I'm not jacked about paying 11-6 in one of the more difficult matchups for a right-hander in all of baseball with just a 28% CSW. You know, it, like, you need to induce swing and miss and called strikes, too. Like, you need high CSW against Toronto, and, you know, just 28% for Zach Wheeler's kind of leaving it on the table for me. Now, I know we don't have a lot of options today, but still, Zach Wheeler at 11-6, I think, is, is kind of insane. He's been consistent, but it's really mostly only in the 20-point range. I think the upside for him is totally priced out. Now, could he pop for 30, 28 here, or something like that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, that's not totally unheard of, because this is still Zach Wheeler. He's got excellent fastball command, but the breaking stuff leaves it on the table for him relative to league average. And there's plenty of other pitchers on the on the day today that have better breaking stuff. We'll get to one in the next couple of games, probably the next game, um, who has a far, far better matchup. He's cheaper, and he's got better stuff uh, in terms of, you know, a, a breaking arsenal. So, um, yeah, I'm not doing this with this price tag and 25% ownership on Zach Wheeler. I'm not sure if I'm going to X him because it's dangerous when you – X probably the best fundamental pitcher on the day but like my goodness this is out of control uh it's just based on how I play it, it's way out of my price range uh to be paying this and uh, against Toronto it's just um the ownership is way too high and I I've got no interest in doing that so does that mean I want to stack Toronto on the other side? Well, no, because I don't like going after Zach Wheeler. He's still very strong. He's got a 33% K rate against the right side of the plate. Uh, it's still very hard to get through. You know, no matter like he's got to be absolutely awful and performing several standard deviations outside of his norms in order for you to get there with Toronto. They still don't have many lefties, which is how you mostly want to attack from a swing and miss perspective against Zach Wheeler. But Brandon Belt is a heavy fly ball hitter that swings and misses at a 30% clip. Not the best batted ball profile matchup here against Wheeler. Kevin Biggio the same. Um, and they have Dalton Varsho, who has been absolutely garbage all season. Uh, it, do we really want to be playing some lefties here trying to get leverage off of the Zach Wheeler? I mean, I don't really necessarily. Now, normally that would put me on to Wheeler, of course, but, you know, I've ranted already about the price tag and the ownership. So no thank you here. I don't want to play any of these right-handers either because of the suppression against righties for Wheeler. is still fantastic. 23% soft contact rate is great. So, yeah, you could make an argument to get a little bit of exposure from a fundamental perspective to Zach Wheeler. But, uh, yeah, I think a lot of your upside is capped, and, and you're going to want to play some very expensive offenses tonight. Arizona, Atlanta, uh, St. Louis, uh, maybe Boston, right? And the Dodgers, definitely. So it's going to make it super difficult to get excited about Zach Wheeler here. You might even want to play the Phillies against Yusei Kikuchi. I mean, I certainly do, because 9000 for him is pretty overpriced if I, um, you know, got to choose here. Like, Kikuchi is still having problems giving up pop. He's giving up a 195 X ISO. Homers for sure, 160 per nine, and a raw 4% homer rate. He's on the barrel at a 9% clip. That's not horrific, but it's still slightly elevated. The control has been much better. He's not walking the whole country like he was last season. And the swing and miss is there a little bit, but he's still not a $9,000 arm. And this is a sneaky, difficult matchup, I think, uh, against Philadelphia. Even though in aggregate they have not created against left-handers this year, they still strike out a lot. These numbers here are slightly inflated, mostly due to Kyle Schwarber's 30% K rate, Bryce Harper's 30% K rate against lefties this season, and, you know, Trey Turner's, you know, underperformance. Uh, he's striking out a little bit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
there's some swing and miss here for the Phillies, but a lot of the right-handers in particular, Alec Bohm, Nick Castellanos, JTR, um, they just picked up Rodolfo Castro as well. Like, these guys hit left-handers very, very well, and Kikuchi is still very susceptible to giving up pop to the right side. 260 batting average allowed is not a small number, right? 180 ISO, not a small number. There's just some swing and miss there, but from the right side, like an Alec Bohm, he's not going to swing and miss pretty much at all, right? 15% K rate for him against left-handers this season. Castellanos, he'll swing and miss a little bit, 24%, but he's hitting 330 nearly with a 400 Woba and a 225 ISO. These guys are still going to hit for a good bit of power outside of the Bryson Stott, who likely won't even be in the lineup. Or, um, you know, maybe like a Edmundo Sosa or something like that. Not a ton of power there, but, you know, a 180 ISO from Sosa is not nothing necessarily. So I think there's a good bit of upside here, mostly for the right-handers. Uh, batted ball-wise, Bryce Harper hitting a lot of ground balls against lefties this season. And he's striking out a lot. He's Bryce Harper, so you can play him against anybody in baseball. That's not a problem. But at 5500 it's a little expensive. And you could probably come off of him if you want to get to full right-handed Philly stacks. I don't think this is bad. Same thing with Schwarber. He's 5,200 still. He has all the pop in the world, but he has to make contact first. And Kikuchi is still going to be able to throw it past him a little bit. Um, now, if you're full stacking Philly and getting after Kikuchi, you're expecting Kikuchi to get blown apart and not having any left-handed exposure with Harper and Schwarber getting into the Toronto bullpen is probably a mistake. So I'd keep that in mind if you get to some Toronto, despite the fact that the batted ball profile against Kikuchi for the left-handers is not stellar. It's still Schwarber and, and Harper, and they still have plenty of upside. So uh, give me mostly the right-handers here against Kikuchi. I don't want 20% of my teams with Yusei. There's no chance I go anywhere near this at this particular price tag. So I think this is a very sneaky game for offense, not so much for Toronto against Wheeler. Uh, but these two pitchers are, are overpriced, and the ownership is way too high for them. I'd rather pivot elsewhere. Uh, and I do kind of like Philly as a an off-the-board stack here tonight against Kikuchi. Um, I want to play all of these guys. I even think that it, it could be an upside spot for Trey Turner here tonight, who has been dreadful for the most part against everybody this season. So give me some Philly. Uh, they're only you know about a buck fifteen. They're slight favorite in the betting markets tonight. I think this is a pretty okay play, and because you know they got Wheeler going on the mound, so he's still one of the top 10, 12 arms in baseball. Even though this is a difficult matchup, you just can't play him, at least I can't play him in DFS at that price tag and that ownership. Okay, let's move on. Pittsburgh and the Mets. Uh, Bailey Falter, I'm not playing this. 6,400, think he's too expensive, and I think he stinks. Um, I used to stack against him all the time with right-handers when he was in Philly, and that is not going to change here now that he is with Pittsburgh. Um, so give me the Mets. And go right back to him, just as you could have last night against Quint Priester, who clearly just doesn't have it, is not ready for the big leagues. Uh, Bailey Falter is mostly a bullpen type of arm. They've tried to stretch him out because he does have an arsenal that could play as a starter. Um, but you need swing and miss, and he's only got 15% strikeouts in the tank here. Um, just an 8% swinging strike rate. You need swinging strikes against the Mets if you're going to go after them because they make a lot of contact. Not a very high upside offense necessarily, but you still have to be able to throw it past them, and Bailey Falter's not going to be able to do that. So no thank you at, at this price tag. Even though very low ownership is attractive against a mediocre offense, um, the price tag's too high, and I think we need some upside on the mound here tonight. you got a 13-game slate. You're going to need 25 and 30. I don't think Bailey Falter has that in this matchup. So give me the Mets. Um, it's mostly the, the top... Six, I guess. Uh, I don't really want to be playing many lefties here, but for the same reason you would stack some lefties against Yusei Kikuchi, you could do the same thing against Bailey Falter if you're, fi if you're five stacking the Mets. Um, so play Brandon Nimmo again. He's still cheap enough at 4,200. I do like Frankie Alvarez here, but who the hell knows what Showalter's going to do. He could put him in the seven or the five, or he could sit him tonight. I mean, I don't know what the hell he's doing. Um, but I do like him tonight at 4,000. Really kind of wherever he hits, you know, if he's in the seven or lower, that takes me off a little bit on a home team for a $4,000 catcher. It's kind of st tough to stomach sometimes, but um, I'm fine playing him if he's in the top half. Pete Alonzo and Frankie Lindo, of course. Uh, Mark Vientos, if you want to play a short little three-man 
uh, or mix him in at third base, 2,400. He's got plenty of pop also. Um, and Bailey Falter's not going to throw it past these guys. So you can play lefties, you can play righties. It doesn't really matter. You probably want to stay off of the bottom third for the most part because the Mets stink. Um, my favorite, as is usual with the Mets, is, is short stacks and the good hitters. Uh, but you can convince me that a, a full five stack is in play against Bailey Falter. Uh, same thing with the Pirates, right? Getting David Peterson over here, he was, he's been dreadful uh, in terms of power allowed all season. Now, he's been better since they sent him down and, and brought him back up. Um, but even still, he's still giving up a 250 ISO to lefties in a shortest sample. But a 160 ISO to right-handers is not nothing. 300 batting average allowed to right-handers over 50 full innings is not nothing. He's pitching to way too much contact to right-handers in particular. And he does induce a lot of ground balls. That does put him in play from that perspective. He does have some whiffs, so that's slightly attractive as well. He could be in play at 6,700. I don't think it's horrible necessarily. I think he's the ownership may be a little fishy here. Uh, I'd like this projection to be a bit higher if I'm going to you know, just click in 20% of my teams with David Peterson. I don't freaking trust the guy, um, to be quite honest. He's got a very suspect strike one rate at 58%, sub 30% chase, and just a you know a 29% CSW is nice, but he's got a buck 60 whip. He walks too many people, and the contact profile in terms of hard contact is a little suspect for me. So I want to be careful with this. I think he's in play getting some of the pirates over here, but they are sneaky okay still against uh, left-handed pitching. Not so much in power, and that would take me off of full pirate stacks. Right, this is still at City Field, and a hard ballpark to get too thrilled with offense in but a 90 wrc plus 23 and a half percent is average slightly above average uh or slightly below average for an offense uh in the k rate they walk a little bit will hit for a little bit of average but they hit a lot of ground balls so that's what's going to keep david peterson in play for the most part um cabrian hayes at 4,000. they'll probably lead him off or have him up in the top third top half of the lineup i think he's a fine play Brian Reynolds from the right side, I'm not super jacked, about 4,600 necessarily. Um, McCutcheon, you can still play at 38. Connor Joe, I like against pretty much every lefty in baseball. Uh, 3,200, I like this. Dual eligible still. Henry Davis is fine at 31 as well. If you need a cheap piece, uh, mix in either of Pagiero or Alika Williams uh, in the middle infield, that's fine as well, too, if you get to a full five stack. You can stack the game here and try and attack some offense, but do keep in mind, this is City Field. It's only 75 degrees there, so uh, probably some better hitting environments across the league tonight. Um, so David Peterson is in play because of the ground ball and the whiff stuff, but not my favorite because, like I said, he walks too many people for me. I need him to go deep into a game, and I'm not sure he's got a full six or seven inning upside. And at 7,000 nearly on the mound, I kind of need that. Um, so he's in play in tournament stuff because the price tag is going to make it work. But, uh, you know, not necessarily my favorite. I do prefer the Mets, though, Frankie Alvarez and, you know, PD and Frankie Lindor, Mark Vientos, of course. Okay, let's move on. Yankees, Atlanta. Man, the Yankees are terrible, man. They're just so bad. And the Braves, they're just so good. Like, it's every damn night with this team. You have to, you just have to have exposure. Um, and it doesn't matter. It's every one of them. So, Severino is a total non-starter here tonight for the Yankees at 5,900 on the mound. I don't care about the low ownership. He's not throwing it past anybody, and he's giving up power left and right. 231x ISO here is egregious. A 300x BA with a 389x WOBA. Still walking 9% of guys. 34% hard contact with neutral ground balls per fly ball. 22.5% um, aggregate line drive rate is insane. So, yeah, go right back to Atlanta. And the good news from a DFS perspective is that Ozzy Albies is out. And you don't have to try and figure out how to pay 6000 for the guy. So they've got Michael Harris. He'll likely be up in the two again at 4100 I really like this batted ball matchup for him tonight. He's one of the better plays in the outfield today, I think, at 41. He'll be in the two. Uh, they did bring up Vaughn Grissom to replace Ozzy Ozzie Albies. So he'll likely down be down at the bottom of the lineup. He is going to be a cheap piece. Don't have his price tag off the top of my head. Um, let's check really quick. Uh uh, they did bring him up. He's 3,400 at shortstop. 
sole shortstop, so they'll have to decide what they want to do between Grissom and Nicky Lopez. It'll probably be Nicky Lopez uh, because he is from the left side, number one, and he's been fantastic since they brought him over from Kansas City. So likely to give Von Grissom a day and maybe put him back in the lineup uh, in a better spot. You know, that said, the Braves are far easier to stack today than they have been pretty much in the last, I don't know, two and a half, three months nearly. Um, so play everybody if you can make it happen. Still not super thrilled about Sean Murphy, uh, but he is a very high fly ball hitter, and batted ball-wise, this matches up pretty well. So I don't care necessarily about the very expensive price tags here tonight for the Braves. This is one of the better spots and one of the better stacks, even price adjusted, they're still popping uh, number two in aggregate value score. So this is a very high upside spot for Atlanta tonight against Severino, who has been absolutely dreadful. I think he's totally broken. Um, and I have no problem going after him tonight. So give me some Acuna, even though he's finally up to 6,800. He should still be you know, 69 or 7,000 even. Um, and mix in Austin Riley at 59. And Matt Olson certainly at 61. Even though he is a fly ball hitter, it strikes out a crap load. Uh, the 090 ground ball to fly ball profile here for Severino still plays into Matt Olson's strength a little bit. Hard contact at 39%. Look at this, three homers per nine to lefties. Like, my goodness. Uh, so play everybody, right-handers, left-handers, doesn't matter, from Atlanta. Bryce Elder is going for them. All right, the spot here puts him in play. The price tag, not so much. I think it's fishy, kind of high, to be quite honest. Um, he's a heavy ground ball pitcher, right, which is great. Three to one ground balls per fly ball to the right side. Suppression is very good there, but we're still looking for negative regression to come to Bryce Elder, right? He's still got suppression metrics pointing about a run, three quarters of a run higher than his realized ERA here at three and a half. I do like the ground balls, of course. I don't like that there's no strikeout stuff. And when we go after the Yankees, we kind of need that to realize some upside. Now, a lot of the guys from the Yankees are still fly ball hitters, right? Notably, Aaron Judge. Uh, Stanton's slight ground ball lean, but he's you know effectively neutral for all intents and purposes. Um, and he can obviously still lift the baseball if he can ever freaking make contact. Harrison Bader, fly ball hitter. Jake Bowers, fly ball hitter. Billy McKinney... Um, is a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy himself against right-handed pitching. So a Yankee stack could be found here against a slightly fishy price tag at 8,700. I don't think Bryce Elder warrants this. Yeah, sure, the early season results for him, you know, warranted a higher price tag, uh, but not anymore. His last eight starts have been absolutely dreadful, and we had been waiting for this sort of regression to start to set in with him. And sure enough, his last six starts even have been just terrible. So... Uh, I don't want to deal with most of the Bryce Elder here tonight. I think you can consider stacking this game if you could make it happen. I'd much prefer to just get to full five, five-man five Brave stacks, maybe even mix in three Yankees if you could make a Judge, uh, Jake Bowers type happen in the outfield with, um, you know, an Acuna or a Michael Harris or something like that. You know, it, it would be difficult to stack the game. But... I think it's very viable. I don't want to play Bryce Elder. I think he's a little expensive here. And I think the Yankees, Bowers, Judge, even Glaber a little bit, Billy McKinney, Harrison Bader, they could get to him um, and lift the baseball a little bit. Because some of these guys are not necessarily, like IKF, for example, doesn't strike out. He might be in the lineup again. Um, it's a lot of ground balls, so I don't really want to play him. But that's a bat in there that's going to make things difficult contact-wise on Bryce Elder. He's still pitching to 79% contact with hard contact above 35 percent at 36 percent still so um i'm looking for more negative regression to come to bryce elder and i think the yankees even though they're a horrible horrible offense um they've got you know one and a half good hitters here and that's judge you know for the full one and a half um obviously glaber is fine but you know, for the most part, like DJ striking out a ton this season, not making a lot of contact, dealing with the injuries. Jake Bauer strikes out a lot. You know, McKinney is still going to strike out. So, like, it, it's difficult to get really excited about playing the Yankees, but Elder's not really going to throw it past them necessarily. So I think a, a stack could be found. Okay, let's move on since I am yapping. Uh, Detroit and Minnesota. Here's the guy I want to play, Bailey Over. We'll get to him in a sec. 
Uh, Alex Fiedo, I don't want to play, 7,000. Um, I, I, I want to get to the Twins. Uh, unfortunately, I think the field is probably going to agree, and I hate playing the Twins when they're kind of popular, but this is a really good spot. Fiedo's given up production in spades, mostly to right-handers, you know, so far in the early short sample going here. Just 165 hitters seen with a 250 XBA, 326 X Wobe, and a 225 X ISO. It's the ISO and the power that really attracts me here, mostly uh, with the Twins, because they hit for power against right-handers. They will strike out, yes, but Fiedo against right-handers is going to have some strikeout stuff, but not so much against the lefties, right? Just 19% here in aggregate in the 85 hitters that he's seen this season. 45% hard contact is way too high with a neutral ground ball to fly ball ratio against the left side of the plate here. So I think there's power to be found against Fiedo. Um, he's a three-pitch guy, four-seamer slider change, but the change is bad, right? So that's that's where the lefty lack of swing and miss is going to really play for the Twins. Um, so give me Eddie Julian. His problem is strikeouts. And he hits a lot of ground balls, so against a fly ball lean type of pitcher in Alex Fajardo, give me Eddie Julian. It's a really good batted ball matchup for him to get to baseball on a line here. Georgie Polanco is at 4,400. I think this is fine as well. From the right side, my favorite's got to be Carlos Correa, even though he's been terrible this season. 4,300, I really like this. Not super jacked about playing the, the heavy fly ball hitters from the left side of the plate. Um... I'd prefer to get to, like, a Christian Vasquez behind the plate, for example, from the right side. So I really do like an Eddie Julian, Polanco, Correa, uh, Vasquez. Throw in Joey Gallo. Throw in Michael Taylor. You know, throw in a Kepler or a Walner or whatever. Because if you're expecting Fayetto to get blown up, as we kind of are, then, you know, you you got to have exposure to pretty much everybody. Um, so we'll see who they have behind the plate. Like I said, you know, batted ball profile-wise, I like Christian Vasquez. He hits more ground balls. That's going to play into... And he strikes out less than Jeffers. Uh, he's going to play into his strengths a little bit more. So I like the Twins uh, a good bit. No Fajardo for me. And Bailey Ober, I want to play some correlated teams with the Twins here. He's only seen 15% ownership right now. And the guy above 10,000, this is this is the one I want to play. Uh, I want nothing to do with a couple of guys we'll get to here in a little while, in addition to the Zach Wheeler at 11.6 or whatever. 10-2, it's an expensive price tag for Ober. Um, generally, I don't think he warrants this type of price tag either. So, unfortunately, we just got to kind of make decisions. And if we're going to be playing cheap twins, you know, they're very cheap. They can make a Bailey Over team happen. Uh, may as well just play correlated stuff because he's still got 25% Ks in the tank. His m major problem is hard contact and fly balls to the right side. But really, Detroit's going to kind of platoon over here. Um, now, Torkelson, of course, from the right side, is he'll be in there. Matt Veerling as well from the right side. But Tork hits a lot of fly balls himself, so it's not necessarily the best batted ball matchup. Um, they're going to platoon, and they've got some fly ball hitters from the left side of the plate against righties, too, like Akil Badu. He's kind of a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy. Riley Green, though, is a fly ball hitter, so is Kerry Carpenter. McKinstry as well. So I think that, that plays into Bailey over strengths here. The, these guys are still going to swing and miss. And even from the left side, uh, like like a Badu, like a Riley Green, Kerry Carpenter, these guys' problems are strikeouts. McKinstry, not necessarily, but he's still going to strike out a 22 23% clip or so. Um, and I'm not playing anybody down to the bottom third of the lineup from the Tigers on a 13-game slate. So I think that puts Bailey over in play here. Despite a depressed strikeout rate to the left side himself, he's still elite with a really good changeup in terms of power allowed to the lefties. Gets a lot of pop-ups and weak contact uh, to the left side of the plate too. So they're not going to have a lot of righties in here, which could make it really difficult on Tim um, you know, from a hard contact to fly ball perspective. But he's still got 28% strikeouts there too, and, you know, you're going to need that against Torque, who doesn't really strike out all that much. So give me some Bailey over and correlated teams with the Twins here. you got to lay nearly $2 on them in a betting market, so that not my favorite play there. Uh, it seems pretty okay, I think, if you want to throw them in, like, parlays or whatever. That's probably fine, but in DFS, um, you know, it's pretty rare. I'm going to get super excited about the Twins, but I think this is a spot that warrants that. Uh, okay, let's move on to Oakland and St. Louis. As I mentioned at the outset, we got Spencer Watkins in here. He has not thrown in the big leagues this season. Um, 
he has been in Oakland or in AAA for Oakland all year. Came over from Baltimore in the off season, I believe. Um, now Spencer Watkins has a cutter changeup. It keeps him really down in the strike zone against left-handers. He's got nearly a, a two to one ground ball to fly ball ratio historically against left-handers. Um, and that's really the cutter and the changeup going to work. So I don't really want any left-handers outside of the one sort of Nolan Gorman, maybe an Alec Burleson type of piece, guys that can lift the baseball um, and are going to make some good, solid contact. Lars, he's kind of a ground ball hitter. Uh, 4,500, not super thrilled about it, but this is still Spencer Watkins, and he's very attackable because he doesn't throw it past anybody with the cutter change. doesn't induce a lot of swing and miss. He, against right-handers, um, you know, he floats the slider a little bit, and he's got a four-seamer. So that gives him a fly ball lean, as a matter of fact. And it's a pretty severe delta. He's about an 075 ground ball to fly ball to uh, right-handers. And he gives up power there with a 5-0 career XFIP. So um, give me some right-handers here and the Cardinals. I think you can go right back to St. Louis tonight. And you can play Goldschmidt and Arenado, Tyler O'Neill, Jordan Walker once again. Price tags haven't changed all that much. For these guys, Andrew Kisner, interesting catcher piece, even though I hate playing catchers down at the bottom of the lineup on home teams, uh, especially on huge favorites like this. You know, the Cardinals are 240 in a betting market, so that's not my favorite. But as a DFS catcher punt, I think that's fine at 2,900. He still has pop, even though he doesn't hit for all that great a an average. Uh, so give me some St. Louis, and obviously you can't even play Spencer Watkins because as of now, he's not in the player pool. Um Dakota Hudson, I'm going to do the same thing as I did last night with uh, Miles Michaelis. I'm going to fade him again. Now, Dakota Hudson is more in play tonight than Michaelis was last night for me. The reason he's more in play, well, he's 1,200 cheaper, and he's not seeing he's seeing half the ownership that Michaelis saw last night. Obviously, plenty of things have changed. 15% is roughly the same as 30%. Um, you know, on a 13 game slate, that 30 is on an eight game slate. You know, that said. He still only has a 16% K rate, 57% strike one, 25% chase, and a sub-10% swinging strike rate. He just doesn't have the upside on a 13-game slate to pop for 30 points. And you kind of need that a lot of the time if you're going to win tournaments. 5,800, the price tag puts him in play for a serviceable outing of 20 points or whatever. And that's generally okay in, like, cash if you want to do that. Um but, like, you really want to get excited about playing a 16% strikeout rate guy in cash games? I really don't. Because we saw what even Oakland could do against Michaelis last night. He gave up three or four runs. or And it, it, with guys that can't throw it past anybody, they're totally dead in the water if they can't make up that production. So um, I'm going to leave Hudson on the shelf again, even though he is slightly more in play. I do like the value score here and the projection for somebody down in this range. There's nobody else down here that you're comfortable playing, but I don't really think you're going to need to because you've got some cheaper offenses, namely the Twins, a um, couple others that we'll get to, that make it easier to get to some more expensive pitching and more expensive primary or even secondary stacks. So no thank you on the Dakota Hudson. I think he's terrible. Um, he doesn't have an out pitch, right? He doesn't have a viable slider against right-handers, and he doesn't have a viable changeup against left-handers. He has the cutter that's going to you know, induce ground balls, right? But the only way he's going to last a full six innings here or seven innings and realize 30-point upside is if he realizes some strikeouts, which is unlikely, and a hell of a lot of ground ball upside. Um, that is likely, but you need both of those things to happen for him to pop in tournaments for you. So uh, at healthy ownership here, 15%, I'm probably just going to leave it on the shelf and go elsewhere and just try and get contrary and structure my teams otherwise. Okay, let's move on to a ridiculous game here in, with the Angels and the Rangers. Um, now, Scherzer tore the Angels apart last night. Uh, this is a bad offense. We talked about this yesterday. They are dreadful. Um, but that does that mean we want to be playing? Now, the, Texas is not dreadful, right? We'll get to Texas mostly in a minute. But uh, do we want to be playing these guys, Jordan Montgomery at 11,000 and Giolito at 10-7 in these particular matchups? Um, well, number one, Jordan Montgomery is stupidly overpriced. This is not quite an all-time price high for him, but he hasn't seen 11,000 in uh, nearly three full seasons. He was 11,400 against Baltimore in 2021. 
Um, outside of that, this is a 9K arm. Like, Jordan Montgomery is not an $11,000. He's seen a $2,000 price bump. I don't know what the hell we're doing over here. Uh, but this is out of control, and I am just – it's way too high for me. I'm not paying it, um, even against a dreadful, dreadful offense. The Angels are mostly m- – more attackable with right-handers like a Max Scherzer, for example, but because they still got Grichik and C.J. Crone and Moustakas and all these guys in the lineup. Against left-handers, however, those right-handers like a Grichik, like a C.J. Crone, like the return of Brandon Drury, for example, Hunter Renfro, Eddie Escobar even from the right side, uh, they they can create a little bit, right? They're far more dangerous. I know these numbers don't... Um, reflect the lack of Mike Trout, you know. But all of these guys ha- are still having excellent seasons against left-handed pitching that I mentioned. Even Ren Hifo as well. So, with Jordan Montgomery's problems against right-handers, I, I call it problems. Uh, it's mostly power. 180 ISO, right? 21% strikeout rate. It's not all that impressive. 36% hard contact. He still gives up pop and power and a neutral ground ball to fly ball ratio to the right side of the plate. I'm not dealing with it at this particular price tag. I think all of the upside for Montgomery, we normally have, like, it's totally priced out. We normally have questions and concerns about upside with him popping to 25-plus fantasy points. And that's when he's priced at 8500 and 9000 He's 11000 now. Uh, so I think this is totally out of out of consideration. I know we went, we went backwards here, but... I think it's pretty easy to fade Lucas Giolito at 10,700 against Texas, too. There's no chance I play this. Um, he's got a traditional split, more traditional split this season against left-handers with the bad change value. He's figured out the walk rate a little bit, but he's not totally figured out the barrel rate. 202 X ISO this season, and he's given it up to both sides. The strikeouts are there, but this is not the matchup to be going after um, You know, one of the best offenses in baseball. You saw what they did last night against a pretty respectable ground ball pitcher in Patty. Well, Patty walks six guys. So if Giolito is more susceptible to walk people, and he really is at eight and a half, um, and your aggregate walk rate here, you know, that puts Texas Stacks once again in play. Do you want to go out of your way and play 6,000, Marcus Semien, 57, Addy Garcia? No, you, you don't really. But... Um, I'd, I'll play Corey Seager against everybody in baseball. I don't really care. It's every night with this kid. 6,300 is probably a steal for him in this particular matchup. Giolito's still going to give up a lot of fly balls, and Corey Seager's going to hit the baseball in the air and over the wall a lot. So uh, give me him as well. Jonah Heim is fine, and you're going to have to mix in some of the cheaper guys down at the bottom, but uh, I'm not touching these price tags um, on these pitchers here tonight. So give me the offenses. Mostly Texas, of course, uh, you know, but I, I think the Angels are very much in play here, taking some shorts on Jordan Montgomery uh, with a Randall Grichik, 3,300 in particular. He'll be in the middle of the lineup. 34 for Hunter Renfro doesn't strike out a lot. C.J. Crone is 41. Brandon Drury has historically fantastic numbers against left-handers, 4,600. You can always play Otani. I don't generally like playing left-handers against Montgomery because he's elite there, but uh, mix him in in stacks, yeah, for sure. As I mentioned, Eddie Escobar, uh, Chad Wallach has popped behind the plate. Ren Hifo from the right side is fine leading off. The Angels are a viable stack here, and you know, do I want to go out of my way and stack 25% of them? Well, let's not get carried away. But going after an $11,000 price tag and 15% ownership, you're getting some leverage here on Jordan Montgomery fading him. I, there's no chance I play him at this price tag. So maybe it makes me look like a jackass, but... Um, I'm okay with that. No pitching for me here in this game, and offense only. All right, let's move on. White Sox and the Cubs. Um, Tuki Toussaint, also no chance I play him. 6,900. He's walking everybody. 16% walk rate still. It's to both sides of the plate. Uh, 17% to lefties, 14% to righties. Now, he's not giving up a lot of power, right? And he's inducing growl balls, which is nice, but he elevates his own pitch count, so there's Zero chance that I, I'm going to be able to get to him at 6,900. And I don't really want to go after uh, the Cubs necessarily. I kind of like to stack them a little bit. Probably short stacks because I'm not jacked about the pricing necessarily. My top, Talkman's price is starting to drift upward a little bit, but he's still at a playable 3,800 when he leads off. Um, Ian Happ is still at 4,000. That's fine. Nico's at 51. It's playable. 
not great because he had some ground balls, but he doesn't strike out. It makes a lot of contact. It's fine. Cody Bellinger is 5,800, kind of a ridiculous price tag for him. Uh, but he'll lift the baseball, and the batter ball profile is all right here. Just a buck 35 ground ball to fly ball ratio for Tukey against left handers this season. Um, so that plays into Belly a little bit. Dansby is at 49, not thrilling. Jamer at 45 is all right. He's got really good numbers against right handers this se- this season. Will hit the baseball in the air, of course. Um, so I'm not super thrilled with the Cubs price wise, but I, you know, Tukey walks everybody. So 51% strike one. Are we kidding here? 10% swinging strike rate. There's no chance we go anywhere near this. Um, so you can play some Cub stacks. I prefer short stacks just because of the pricing, like a Talkman, Ian Happ, and then mix in whoever you want. Jamer or Cody Bellinger, whatever. But I could be convinced that because of the high walk rate, Cub stacks are very much in play. It's only 70 degrees in Wrigley here tonight, so not the greatest hitting environment, which we kind of need at Wrigley. Um, you know, but that doesn't really matter when you're putting people, this many people on base for free. So no Tukey for me. Kyle Hendricks on the mound, 7,400. It puts him in play. It's the changeup that puts him really in play, right? Still inducing ground balls, and this is a very good batted ball profile matchup uh, in terms of the ground ball to fly ball ratios, right? The Sox over here, they got one fly ball hitter since they traded, um, you know, Jake Berger. Like, he tries to lift the baseball, too. From the right side, they don't have anybody that can hit the baseball in the air outside of Luis Robert. Um, You know, they've got a little bit of, like, an Andrew Vaughn from a neutral kind of ground ball to fly fly ball ratio standpoint. But that's pretty much it. They are awful outside of that, and they all hit ground balls through the roof, so to speak. Uh, Tim Anderson, 3300 is a really, really good price tag for him. Um, so if you want to you know, get to a little bit of the White Sox over here, I don't think this is horrible necessarily, but it's only a price play. Um, I do like Kyle Hendricks at 7400 a little bit. It's the changeup, man, and it very much plays. Even against right-handed heavy teams, his changeup is good enough that he can pick through um, – you know, a right-handed heavy list. Generally, a changeup, a, a same-handed changeup is not a very good idea unless it is very, very good. But this is similar. We talked about this yesterday with Grayson Rodriguez, for example. Uh, he's got a bad fastball here to this Kyle Hendricks, but his changeup is fantastic. And if he got, you know, roughly neutral value on the fastballs here, as he does kind of with the two-seamer, the changeup value would skyrocket. It would be north of two and a half and pushing three outs to the field above average. So the changeup is that good, and it can play even against a very right-handed heavy team over here with the White Sox. Now, they do have Benintendi and Yoel Moncada back. They do have Oscar Colas uh, and Grandal. But these, you're not scared of these guys necessarily. And Benintendi hits a lot of ground balls anyway, so, like, whatever. Um, here's the power, though, that he will give up. The changeup can float a little bit sometimes, and that's when you get yourself into trouble. So that would be why you could consider playing some White Sox here, price adjusted, with Tim Anderson, Luis Robert, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, he's clearly the best power hitter on the team. Uh, Eloy Jimenez at 3,600 is fine as well. And Yoan Mokata still has upside at 3,100. Um, you know, to play a 3,200 Andrew Vaughn, you're like, okay, fine, in stacks, whatever. Not my favorite, certainly. I just side with Kyle Hendricks, but uh, it's kind of fishy because he also only has a 16% strikeout rate similar to some of these other guys we've talked about. You need more than this at this price tag on a full 13-game slate. So, yeah, 10, 12% ownership. Yeah, okay, it's fine if you land on it, I think. Um, and that's probably where I'll end up. I'm not going to go out of my way to play 25% Kyle Hendricks. Let's not you know, kid ourselves here. But correlated teams, correlated short stacks, something like that with Kyle Hendricks, I think is very much in play. Um, but I do think you know some sneaky and cheap White Sox, really off the board teams are in play a little bit also. Okay, Seattle and Kansas City. Here's Emmy Hancock today. Uh, 5,500 for him. Now, I'm going to probably leave this off. I don't really want to deal with this necessarily. Uh, I think it's kind of a fishy spot. Now, he's got a good cutter and a good changeup. Those two pitches are going to play for him uh, against left-handers. So he's going to be able to induce soft contact and roll over type of ground balls against the lefties with those two pitches. Um, But I'm kind of worried here 
because he doesn't have an out pitch against right-handers. He has no breaking stuff, at least that he displayed in his in his first start. Um, you know, he did throw 87 pitches, so that's encouraging. Did go five innings, that's encouraging. Um, you know, but we still need an out pitch. He did this against San Diego, you know, which is nice, and the Royals are far worse in San Diego. So 5,500 against the, one of the worst offenses in baseball, yeah, sure. But they still tagged Logan Gilbert yesterday for four runs. It's not like this is a totally inept offense over here. They're, they're mostly inept. But with Salvi and Bobby Witt not actually striking out and the sort of emergence of a Michael Massey, Mikel Garcia stabilizing up at the top of the lineup for them, they're not a total zero anymore. MJ is still making a hell of a lot of hard contact against right-handers as well. Um, Kyle Isbell in a wraparound stack has some speed, has some pop. You know, this is not a total zero lineup anymore. 86 WRC plus is not good, but it's not horrific. Average strikeout rate, you can still go after guys that have swing and miss, but as we just talked about, Emmy Hancock doesn't really have a swing and miss pitch, notably against the right side. They're going to be pretty balanced here, so I think you could get to some sneaky Royals teams. I don't think it's horrible going after a really young arm here that doesn't have swing and miss against same-handed hitters. That's Bobby Witt territory. That's Salvi Perez territory. I st- I'm still not excited about 5,800 Bobby Witt, but, you know, so it goes. Salvi Perez, of course, at 44, you can still play him with dual eligibility. It's really nice. Um, and I like Garcia. I like Massey. I like MJ. And you can mix in any one of the guys down at the bottom third of the lineup if you need to. So I think some Royal stacks are in play here a little bit against Emmy Hancock, even though a 5,500 against a bad offense generally has to put a guy in play. I'm worried about upside, so I'm just going to leave it on the shelf for him tonight. Jordan Lyles is going for the Royals, 6,500. I'm not I'm not doing this. I don't play Jordan Lyles anymore. Uh, I think there's maybe once or twice that I've said that he could be in play. I'm not sure tonight is it. When we go after Seattle, we need guys that have swing and miss. Jordan Lyles doesn't have that anymore, and he gives up pop in spades here, right? 213 X ISO with a 341 X WO, but 262 XBA. Um, too many fly balls, too much hard contact, and too many homers. Too many barrels, not enough swing and miss for Jordan Lyles anymore. So that puts Seattle in play as well. I think with the Twins, unfortunately we get into this sometimes with these two teams, they're just bad offenses in very good matchups. You're going to have to kind of play some Seattle here tonight. I I like Julio once again, 5,600. I think that's fine still. I really like Gino here tonight at 43, um, going after some Jordan Lyles. Gino is still kind of a, a neutral ground ball to fly ball type of guy that makes good hard contact against right-handers. I think this is a good spot at, at 43 for him if he's in the two-hole, and he likely will be. I'm going to go right back to Kyle Raleigh tonight, 46, even though we put up a zero um, disappointingly last night. Tay Oscar, this is a good spot for him at 3,700. It's a fine spot to mix in some Ty France. Some Zoni in the outfield for Dom at 2,500. I think, it, I mean, the price tag you know, has to put him in play, and he's going to make cheaper stacks happen for you. So I think uh, Dom is perfectly fine there. Played a little bit of him last night. He was one of the better outfield plays, uh, value plays, um, you know, from a, a pricing perspective. Yesterday, and, and that'll, you know, persist today as well. So you can play any of the three down at the bottom of the lineup. Um, you know, Cade Marlowe, Dylan Moore, if it's Josh Rojas in there, it likely will be. This is a fine spot for Josh Rojas, as a matter of fact. He hits a lot of ground balls and batted ball profile-wise, max, matches up pretty well uh, from the left side since Lyles gives up so many fly balls and a lot of hard contact. It's an upside spot for him with dual eligibility at second and third at 3,200. It's sort of in the um, in the infield for you. So um, if you need a second base piece, for example, in Seattle stacks. So that's kind of how I'd like to play this. Some offense here uh, at Kaufman. It is only 75, 80 degrees, so I'm not jacked about that necessarily, but I think some, some offense here uh, from both sides this puts game stacks in play. These guys are cheap enough, and you can still get to some expensive pitching uh, otherwise if you stack this game. So I think that's a really intriguing tournament play. Okay, let's move on. Arizona, Colorado. Arizona was garbage last night outside of uh, whoever did Christian Walker, right? Um, I'm going to go right back to him. I think he's still price-adjusted the best play of the team 
outside of you know Kyle Lewis, who was garbage. Uh, Jace Peterson was garbage. Uh, it's pretty hard to be that bad against Chris Flexen, but sure enough, the Arizona Diamondbacks made it happen, made me look like an idiot. So, yeehaw. Uh, at least there were a lot of other idiots playing them, too. Um, it's going to be a bullpen game for the D-backs here tonight. I've got Joe Maniply, um on the mound for them. It's likely to be um, Cade Ciccone, uh coming in as the long reliever. He's only got, I believe, the one start. I don't have him here in the sheet um, just because we have a lack of data. Uh, but it's going to be a bullpen game, and you're not going to play him at Coors Field. Um, anyway, could you play some of the Rockies? Well, yeah, they got Charlie Blackman back last night, and that solidifies a lot of the lineup here, certainly against right -hand, right-handed pitching as uh, Ciccone is a right-hander. Um, Manaply, you can play you know, lefties against him also uh, because the lefties here still hit left-handers pretty well. Charlie Blackman's a career 300 hitter against lefties, so whatever. And he's only going to open for them, um, is man apply. So no problems playing some of the Rockies here tonight. Uh, like Zeke Tovar again, power is actually starting to show up. He's got 14 or 15 jacks this season, a lot of doubles. Kid's really coming into his own. Like he's a $5,500 hitter next season uh, pretty regularly, and he's going to be at the top of the lineup. Um, the growth from this kid since the day he came up has been very, very impressive. So um, it's a mistake if you're fading Zeke Tovar pretty much ever uh, it, outside of, you know, bad matchups. Last night was kind of a bad matchup, but he still he still got there for you. Um, he's 4700 so the price is drifting upward, and his problem is still strikeouts. I don't think we're going to have that issue with him tonight. So I'm fine playing some of him. Uh, Ryan McMahon, unfortunately, up to 4900 he has not been good recently, and he was awful last night. You want to play him for a little bit of a bounce, that's okay. But he looks terrible at the plate. So I'd be careful paying a high price tag for him. Um, Leas Diaz, same thing, has not been anywhere close to the early season Leas Diaz. Uh, but he's a fine stack piece if you want to play him at 47. Brendan Rodgers, still cheap at 33. Nolan Jones is fine at 47. Tolia has been absolutely dreadful. Uh, since they brought him back up, but he's probably going to be in there because they're just going to give him a run and hopefully he just figures it out. But, um, you know, he's slumping pretty terribly. Elleris Montero showing a little bit of pop. His problem is strikeouts, and neither Manaply nor Sacconi are necessarily going to throw it past him. So Rockies are in play top to bottom. Um, I got no problem. Charlie Blackman has is, is got to be the favorite here at 3,300 with Brendan Rodgers as well. On the other side, uh, the, the, the you know Arizona is just going to get um, you know kind of can after can today or uh, this series rather. They get Ty Block tonight. Um, you know he's kind of a respectable arm, but he still doesn't have any swing and miss. He's got a six percent swinging strike rate, and in aggregate this season, um, he's bounced around in a couple of spots. Right, hasn't had a lot of big league exposure just yet, but yeah, you know, he was with. Uh, San Francisco um, is recently as I believe it was last season and been bouncing around a little bit. He's still not throwing it past anybody. So, yeah, go right back to Arizona. I got no problem doing this. Um, you know, price adjusted, they're starting to get expensive. So if you want to go play some other teams at far lower ownership like Atlanta, like the Dodgers who we'll get to, St. Louis, whatever, yeah, no problems doing that. But um, I think you have to have some exposure still somehow Price adjusted, favorite play, still got to be Kyle Lewis, I guess, um, even though he had a really rough night last night. You know, Cattell Marte, 58, is not cheap. Corbin Carroll's not cheap at 6,000. Uh, Tommy Pham is fine at 42. He's got good numbers against lefties this season. Obviously, it's Christian Walker from a, a power perspective as well. He's still fine, and Lourdes Gurriel is at 47. Still fine and still playable, but I think I probably prefer some other stacks, even though, um, you know, Arizona does get tie block with a 9% K rate, 6% swing strike rate at Coors Field. Um, not my personal favorite stack here tonight for tournaments, uh, but for cash games, yeah, just, like, go ahead. Uh, so offense only, as is usual at Coors Field. Okay, Baltimore and San Diego. Jack Flaherty, you know, this is an interesting game here. I think both of these guys, you know, on the surface might look a little enticing. Um, you know, perhaps not Michael Walker at 9,800. We'll get to that in a sec. 8,400 for Jack Flaherty. Uh, 9% ownership could put him in play, but the problem I have with Jack Flaherty here compared to Grayson Rodriguez last night is the changeup. 
He doesn't have a changeup. Flaherty relies on his breaking stuff, that's the slider and the curveball, um, to induce swing and miss. But against left-handers, he doesn't have swing and miss. He's only got an 18% strikeout rate, and he's still walking 12% of them. He's inducing some ground balls. That's the cutter going to work a little bit with the slider down in the strike zone, some of the curveball. But he doesn't have raw swing and miss, and you really need that to get through balanced lineups like the Padres, certainly when you're going after like a Juan Soto, Jay Cronenworth types. Um, Jack Flaherty here at 8,400. Eh, okay, I think he could be in play because um, San Diego is still going to have, what, all of their best hitters in there from the right side. That's Hassan Kim, Tatis, Machado, Bogarts. And he can still get through them with... Uh, break even and a plus curveball, you know, break even slider and a plus curveball, I should say. It's still okay, but he still has walk problems, man. He still has strike one problems. He still has pitch count problems. And this is still a difficult lineup to get through, even though the offense is not all that impressive. Um, they don't strike out a lot, right? 22% and they walk a lot. So that makes it dangerous, even though the price tag is slightly attractive, as is the ownership for Flaherty, makes it very dangerous for him. I think San Diego is more in play tonight than they were last night, even though Grayson Rodriguez's numbers are far, far worse in aggregate than Jack Flaherty's. Um, it's a pitch mix thing, and this is why we go through pitch mix stuff. But do I want to play them at their respective price tags? Not really. Kim is still 5,000. Tati 61. Soto 59. I mean, that's not all that exciting. 56 for Manny and 5,000 for four Bogarts. Jake Cronenworth is up to 45 here. So uh, I'm not super thrilled. Stacks can be found, and they're okay. They're really off the board because the prices are making it difficult. Um, so I'm not super thrilled about playing either side, to be honest. Uh, I think the upside is kind of priced in a little bit for San Diego, even though there is some upside because Flaherty, uh, well, I don't trust this guy, right, to not walk everyone. Uh, Michael Walker, well, he's 9,800, number one. That's like a... Total non-starter. He is not a $9,800 arm. Let's let's get that out of the way. Um, and certainly against Baltimore. However, pitch mix-wise, Michael Walker does have a changeup. He's got a very good changeup. And this is really the only pitch that has kept him in the big leagues over the last several seasons. This season, getting better value out of the four-seamer um, sinker and curveball mix. Cutter is still kind of a work in progress here, but he still does induce soft contact and roll-over type of contact with a little bit of the cutter. It's mostly the changeup, though, that he goes to work with, and Baltimore is going to platoon very heavily. So, despite a very high price tag, very low ownership keeps Michael Waka in place simply due to this one really good pitch. Do I want to play a lot of Baltimore? I mean, you can play a couple of good price-adjusted pieces like Ryan O'Hearn, Cedric Mullins from the left side. However, it's mostly righties that I'd like to get to. Ryan Mountcastle, in particular, 4,400. I think this is a really shrewd play. Ramon Urias, like, he's been awful this season, but he's 2,200 at third base. I don't think this is a terrible sort of late-night sort of punt if you get there because Waka gives up a 175 ISO with just a 20% strikeout rate, 080 ground ball to fly ball to right-handers with a 34% hard contact rate. That's attackable. Not so much in average, so you're kind of homer hunting here and power hunting against Waka. and it'd mostly be with a short stack because he doesn't give up a lot of batting average anymore. Um, he's, he does have a 245 XBA, and he's running quite a bit hot there. 175 X ISO running a little bit hot there as well. So you could see some negative regression come to Waka, and this is why, in conjunction with a 9,800 price tag and an 81% strand rate, you could come off of some Waka. Um, I think a lot of the upside in this particular matchup, it's still Baltimore. This is still a good offense over here, right, against right-handed pitching. Neutral, WRC+, plus, kind of difficult to get through. They hit for a little bit of average, some hard contact, a little bit of pop. They're average for the most part, uh, but dangerous hitters for sure. Um, you know, so it's you know kind of fishy all around, to be honest, with Flaherty against San Diego, San Diego at their price tags, Waka at his price tag with some negative regression coming to him. But a good pitch against an okay offense that's, you know, pretty well price adjusted. So I think some things are in play here. It's a very interesting tournament game. Um, but I don't really have all that great a read on it, to be quite honest, even though I've yapped about it for 10 damn minutes. 
So I think I'm probably going to leave it on the shelf for the most part um, outside of like late slate plays or one off type of, you know, singleton sort of leverage plays or, or contrarian ownership plays. So that's kind of where I stand on that. Uh, I'm going to have to do some more research here, um, to, you know, to have a really strong take. But, um, you know, kind of lukewarm on pretty much everybody here. Okay, Tampa and San Francisco. Um, so we saw what freaking San Francisco and Gabe Kapler did last night. Like, the guy is just a clown. Um, it was Sean Manaya that was the probable long reliever, but he didn't even see any action. He didn't even come into the baseball game. So this is why you can't do this. You can't play a guy like Jake Junis, who's probably only going to be topped out at, like, three innings or something. Um, all of his appearances this season have mostly come out of the bullpen. All, well, all except one, right? So you can't play him either, certainly not at 7,400. And who knows, like, we've got in the player pool, once again, as Manaya as the long reliever, but who the hell knows what Kapler's going to try and pull. Um, they try and play matchups, but it doesn't really matter when you try and play matchups against a team that plays matchups better than you do. I've mentioned this several times with the Giants. They try to be Tampa West, and they just don't have the talent, they don't have the coaching staff or the analytics department that Tampa does to allow that to happen. Um, even though they can get away with their bullpen shenanigans a lot of the time, you can't screw around with this against good teams because they're better than you. And Tampa is certainly better than you. Um, so no Jake Junis. And if you want to go back to a little bit of Tampa, I mean, I say go back to, I didn't play any of them last night um, because it's 65 degrees in San Francisco on a 13 game slate. I'm still not interested. Uh, but this is a good offense still, you know, and if you want to play some short Tampa stacks to minimize your exposure, I don't have problems with that. If you want to play full Tampa stacks on late slates, I don't have problems with that because San Francisco and Jake Junis are very much attackable. Jake Junis has always given up power. He's always given up hard contact. And it's because he's a two-pitch guy with a sinker slider. He doesn't have a changeup, and he doesn't have a four-seamer. So you can go after him with lefties because he doesn't have the break or the off-speed pitch, rather, and he throws a two-seamer. And you can go after him with right-handers because he doesn't induce a lot of a swing and miss, necessarily, even though his numbers do suggest a little bit of that this season. Um, he's, historically, he's not a 27% strikeout guy. He's relying on the slider very heavily, but that's still just two pitches, and he's only going to go you know, whatever, two innings or so. And who the hell knows? If it, if it is Shamanaya coming out of the bullpen, he's very attackable with right-handers. So you're likely to see, I mean, when Tampa's lineup came out yesterday, you saw them stack it with right-handers. They were also expecting Shamanaya, and that's why San Francisco didn't even bring him into the game. Tampa can do that once again. So, it, you know, they're playing from a position of strength here, and San Francisco, from a pitching standpoint, is playing from behind. Um so their price adjusted still fine. You know, I don't want to play Brandon Lau at 49. No, thank you. Or Randy at 54 necessarily. 52 for Yandy is, is kind of fishy. But Isak, Luke Rayleigh probably be back in there tonight. Got a day off last night because they platooned so heavily. Um, Jose Siri will likely be in there. Josh Lowe probably as well. Basabe down at the bottom of the lineup. That's fine. Um, yeah, okay, fine. You want to play a little bit of Tampa? I'm all right with that. We went backwards again, but Zach Littell is on the mound. In his last three starts, he's gone five, six, and six innings, and that puts him in play against San Francisco. Um, he's got some some CSW here. It's not nothing. It's not all that attractive, though. It's just 25%. 20% raw strikeout rate. He does have three pitches, at least, that he can go to work with. It's the split that I'm mostly attracted to here. It's a break-even split relative to league average, but there are some guys that have some really good splits. Notably, Kevin Gosman, for example. Um, I'm okay playing a little bit of Zach Littell. I don't like the 6800 price tag, but I also think the Giants are garbage. They're, they're terrible. Um, so if you want to chase some swing and miss here, I've got no problems doing this with a cheap Zach Littell 6800. We're really targeting like a six-inning type of upside game for him here, um, but that's probably about as... as far as you're going to get but if he can suppress give up maybe a run or two and strike out six that's a serviceable outing for him at this particular price tag not my favorite again i don't think we need to get down this low necessarily um but i think it's okay and it's in play if you land on it or if you need it 
Uh, I think I'd probably rather play like a Kyle Hendricks at 7,400, for example, um, or maybe even a David Peterson I, I, at 67. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, but Zach Littell is in play at very low ownership here against the Giants, who strike out a crap load. So, very little offense for me. Maybe some Tampa. I'm just going to stay off of the Giants. I, I just, I think they're bad, and I hate playing with Gabe Kapler shenanigans. I think he's a clown. All right, uh, last game of the night here, probably the highest upside spot outside of Atlanta for the Dodgers against Adrian Hauser. 8,000, this is an absolute no, total non-starter for me. 18% strikeout rate, 58% strike one, 85% contact. Absolutely not. A lot of power to the left side of the plate, and they're going to platoon very heavily here, the Dodgers, tonight uh, with Freddie Muncy, David Peralta, Jason Hayward, James Outman. Um, not to mention however many freaking left-handers they've, they've got on the bench. Uh, so no chance I play Adrian Hauser. He's very good against right-handers, however, with a 222 ground ball to fly ball ratio and an 095 ISO allowed. So that kind of has to take you off of some of the right-handers. However, batted ball-wise, Mookie's a fly ball hitter against righties. Will Smith is a fly ball hitter against righties. It's the price tags that are going to make you balk a little bit, 64 and 5,600 respectively for those two guys. I'm not playing Kike. I'm not playing Ahmed Rosario. Um, so it's the top six, mostly. And you can mix in Mookie, and you can mix in Will Smith, but be aware that, you know, Hauser is very, very good against righty. So it's probably the most equitable to, to play a left-handed short stack type of game. Um, but Hauser could very well last three innings and give up seven runs here. Um, and I wouldn't bat an eye. So if you don't have full exposure to the Dodgers somehow, I think that's probably a mistake. I think it's a very high upside spot for them, given that Hauser pitches to so much contact at 85% here. It's just too high. Bobby Miller's going on the mound for them, 9,300. I think he's in play here a little bit um, against Milwaukee. Now, he pitches to a lot of contact himself, 79%, but he's very efficient early in the count, 65% strike one. The chase is leaving it on the table for us, and he doesn't have a lot of swinging strikes in him, which is keeping the CSW down. He's a very hard sinker baller type of guy, but he is mixing in the four-seamer, which will induce a little bit of swing and miss for him. And that's why you see a 24% strikeout rate to the left-handers, 21% to the right-handers, and a 22.5% in aggregate. I think he's very much in play. He induces ground balls to the right side. That keeps him in play. It's you got to be a little weary because he does give up 39% hard contact to the right-handers, but so many ground balls, we can stomach a little bit of hard contact. 39% is worrying, but it's still in play here for us, uh, for Bobby Miller, against what's likely to be a pretty right-handed heavy lineup. They've only got, what, three, left, four lefties in there. Right, Yelich, Santana, Freelich, and like a Bryce Terang, for instance. Um I think he's fine. I'm not super thrilled about the price tag necessarily, but Milwaukee is bad, man. Uh, if you want to play a Christian Yelich, I think that's an okay play because Miller's still a, a neutral ground ball to fly ball. Yelich hits the baseball very hard against right-handers, even though he hits so many ground balls. Um, that's still okay. I'm not jacked about a price tag, 55, but it's it's fine. Same thing with Freelick at 4,500, not a super thrilling price tag. Um, but these guys are in play from the left side of the plate. I don't really want to deal with any of the right-handers. It's mostly lefties, and I'm kind of just homer hunting for the most part and power hunting against Bobby Miller. So that puts him in play for me at 9,300. The Brewers against right-handers are, are terrible. 23% uh, strikeout rate, buck 20 ground ball to fly ball, 88 WRC plus with a 142 ISO and a 300 Woba. So uh, I'm fine playing some Bobby Miller. He's going to be able to stay down in the strike zone for the most part and get after this team a little bit. Uh, so correlated teams with Bobby Miller and the Dodgers, if you can make that happen, they're expensive. So you'll have to play David Peralta, who's still very cheap. Jason Hayward, uh, James Outman types, et cetera, et cetera. Max Muncy and Freddie Freeman, are, I think, are two of the best plays of the day here. So, um, yeah, give me all of the Dodgers as much as I can get. And it looks to me like today is going to be a pretty expensive stack type of day. Um so that's why I've kind of come off of Arizona a little bit, as we talked about. So let's review things. We're done. Boston and Washington. Pavetta, sure, but all right. Like, let's be careful. He's got horrible numbers against left-handers here. Um, so if you want to play some leverage pieces with Washington, 
Yeah, yeah, it's okay with guys that don't strike out. It, it's okay. They're kind of expensive for it, though, so not my favorite, which is why I'd probably side with a little bit of Pavetta, but not 25% of Pavetta, I'll tell you that much. Gives up way too much power. No JoJo for me. Give me some Boston. I think this is a really intriguing off-the-board stack here. Um, popping in value score pretty significantly here, and Trevor Story gives him a lot more upside being back in the lineup, even though he's kind of expensive. Philly and Toronto really like the Phillies here against Kikuchi. Uh, I think it's a super shrewd tournament stack. Uh, nobody's going to be on this, and I think this is very viable, as a matter of fact. They're kind of expensive, sure, and don't forget Harper or uh, Kyle Schwarber if you are full stacking them, but I think they are very much in play. I don't want to play Zach Wheeler, however. I think he's too expensive at 11-6, given how many very expensive offenses I want to play. It's just going to cap my, my ownership to him. I'll probably have like 10% just for exposure's sake. Um, no Kikuchi whatsoever and no Toronto because I don't want to attack Zach Wheeler. I still respect him. Pittsburgh and the Mets, offense only here um, for, certainly for New York. Well, yeah, let me backtrack a little bit. I think David, David Peterson is in play a little bit. The... Strikeout stuff in the ground balls put him in play, but he's it has given up a lot of power. So don't be surprised if he gets beat up a little bit um, by some okay hitters here from the right side, notably McCutcheon, uh, Brian Reynolds, um, Connor Joe, definitely Henry Davis, Cabrian Hayes. Like they can platoon over here. They can make things difficult on David Peterson. Uh, if they've got a lefty in the lineup in the top half, you could play that as well because he gives up pop two left-handers too. So that's fine. Um, Mets, though, uh, I want to get to some stacks here if I can. Short stacks mostly. Frankie Alvarez, Lindor, Pete Alonso, Mark Vientos. Maybe like a Danny Mendick, um, Arauz down at the bottom. That's fine. Like, whatever. I think Bailey Falter stinks, and no Bailey Falter for me. Yankees, I think a stack can be found here against Bryce Elder. I'm still looking for more negative regression coming to him. 8,700. Uh, the Yankees are so bad, and he induces so many ground balls that he could survive for, like, 2022 here. Um, and pop, you know, sneak a win out of it and pop for 26 points somehow. I think, for the most part, at 8,700, the upside is capped, however. So I mostly want to just get to the offense. In Atlanta, I think this is one of the best stacks of the day. I, honestly, I think Atlanta and the Dodgers are probably the best uh, expensive stacks of the day. Um, targeting Severino, I think he's fully busted, so zero Sevy for me. Uh, Atlanta is much easier to stack here, which is going to increase their ownership, so keep that in mind. Detroit and Minnesota, a couple of sneaky Detroit pieces here or there could be in play against Bailey Ober, but I'm not super thrilled about it. I want to side with him. He's the guy above 10,000 I want to play at 10-2. Um, so give me as much as I can get here of both him and the Twins. I want to stack all of the Twins against Fajardo. 7,000 against the Twins. You can play any any right-hander in baseball against the Twins because they are garbage, and they strike out a crap load. Um, so 7,000, it's a super shrewd deep tournament play. If you need to do it, if you're playing like Arizona and Atlanta for some, for example, um, you know, Alex Fajardo could make that happen price-wise, but... Uh, you know, it's a super low probability play. I'm just going to side with Minnesota here and go after him. He gives up a lot of power. Oakland, Seattle, uh, excuse me, Oakland, St. Louis. Um, Spencer Watkins likely going for Oakland here, which means let's get to all of the right-handers from St. Louis. Um, he's a reverse split guy that has some decent numbers historically, high ground ball figures against the lefties. So we want to be careful there. Nolan Gorman would be the only lefty from the left side. Um a little bit redundant there. Only lefty I would consider playing against a, uh, a guy with kind of a reverse split here in Spencer Watkins. Gives up a lot of fly balls to right-handers, so give me uh, the righties definitely once again for St. Louis as well. Nice tournament stack there. Um, Oakland, if you want to play a couple pieces there, sure. Yeah, go ahead against Dakota Hudson. I got no problems with this. He's not going to throw it past anybody, and he's going to see some ownership once again. He's 5,800, so he's more playable than Michaelis, but... I still don't want to deal with a lot of uh, Dakota Hudson. He just doesn't have any. I don't think he's very good. He doesn't have any swing and miss. Angels, Texas, no Giolito, no Jordan Montgomery. They're, both of them are way overpriced. And I don't want to deal with this um, in these particular matchups. Giolito, absolutely not against Texas. He gives up too much power and fly balls, and Montgomery is 11,000. It's just a total non-starter. So give me offense here. I like it, the Angels, a little bit. I think they're a very intriguing tournament stack really off the board, even though they have been absolutely horrendous over the last several weeks. Um, this is a good spot for them to kind of, 
break the mold a little bit. White Sox, Cubs, maybe some White Sox against Kyle Hendricks. Very short stacks only, though, and it's only you know because of price plays because fundamentally I think Kyle Hendricks can win this matchup uh, absolutely with the changeup. 7,400, he's in play too. I'd prefer to play him as opposed to Alex Fajardo, for example. And give me some short stacks of the Cubs too against Tukey. He walks the whole country. Since he walks the whole country, full stacks could be in play as well. Seattle and Kansas City. Emby Hancock, no thanks. Um, I like the Royals here as another really off-the-board tournament stack. Filler pieces, probably um, nobody's going to be playing them, so just fill them in with Atlanta, Arizona, St. Louis, Boston, you know, whatever you want, uh, or the Dodgers. That's fine because they're cheap enough to make that happen. No Jordan Lyles, of course. Seattle's going to be relatively popular, and they should be because he gives up too much power and doesn't strike anybody out. So game stacks here, very viable. Filler stacks, uh, everybody from an offensive standpoint. Same thing here in Colorado. Um, you know, I think we're noticing a trend here. Not a lot of pitching we're thrilled with here today, at least not me. Joe Manaply just going to be opening for the D-backs, and it's going to be um, Cade Ciccone coming in for Arizona. So you can get to some Colorado pretty much every one of them. Price adjusted, not the best play, but it's a very high upside stack uh, against an opener and a very young arm in Sakoni. Same thing with Arizona. Price adjusted, not the best play here, but they get tie block in what's likely to be a pretty heavy bullpen game at Coors Field, and it's 90 degrees, so go ahead. Um, Baltimore, San Diego, probably no Jack Flaherty for me. I think it's a fishy spot, even though it's kind of a um, attractive price tag and attractive ownership. I think it's trappy a little bit. Uh, I want to be very careful. He, his walk problems are very questionable, and San Diego still walks. Michael Walker is a super shrewd tournament play, not because he's well-priced, but because he has a very good changeup, and that pitch is going to play here against Baltimore. And they're very likely to platoon pretty heavily tonight. So, um, you know, give me Mount Castle maybe if you want to get off of some of the Waka. But I like... Yeah. Fundamentally, I like Michael Walker. I don't like the price tag, though. Uh, I think a lot of your upside is capped. Um, offensively, San Diego, okay, sure, they're in play if you want to fade Jack Flaherty because when he starts walking everybody, he could be absolutely, you know, a total trash can. So that's fine, but they're very expensive and not my favorite. Tampa, San Francisco, mostly just Tampa here for me, uh, but very little, I think, um, where they're par price adjusted and or where they're priced well, I should say. I think that's fine. Going after some Junis, he gives up a lot of power. So you can get to some short stacks, maybe just one-off pieces for me, are probably my favorites. Littell is in play, but I pivot it to Kyle Hendricks uh, for the most part, I think. Uh, maybe David Peterson instead. But, you know, if he's got six-inning upside in him in San Francisco, yeah, sure, sign me up. Um, so no San Francisco. I'm just going to stay off of it. I think his team is terrible. Milwaukee and the Dodgers, very little Milwaukee for me here. Just late slate plays like a Yelich or a Freelich, maybe a Bryce Terang. No right-handers, though. I don't want to deal with that. Bobby Miller, I think, is in play at 93 for sure in correlated Dodgers teams. Dodgers not seeing a lot of ownership right now, and I think that's a big mistake. They are one of the best teams here, um, or getting one of the best matchups, I should say, against Adrian Hauser, who pitches to 85% contact. So that's it. We're done here. Keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates as always. And good luck to everybody here on this big Tuesday 13 Gamer.